going to make any difference for, for this upcoming season. But I mean, so you know, next week he says, yeah, okay, I'm going to release him, and then something else happens that upsets him. I mean, that type of mentality is just never going to work for any business, uh, much more uh, government. So I mean, uh, it's pretty frustrating to be able to tell anyone anything, actually. But it's funny because I spoke to a senior staffer for the administration this morning, and what they told me was the sort of the latest incarnation of, of how they perceive this. But they want to see this legislature come up with a plan to replenish the rainy day fund. So, so I guess I'm kind of wondering: is that is that part of a solution that makes everyone happy around here? Do we want to put a FY15 that puts that 20 million back to the municipal revenue share? I think it's disingenuous for the governor's office to say that they want to replenish the rainy day fund when they have not put forward a supplemental budget. If they truly had an intent to find out how we were going to finance going forward, they would put their project on the table instead of standing back with their hands in their pockets and wondering what's going to happen next. I think it's disingenuous at, at best. And, and in addition, there already is a plan to replenish the rainy day fund. That was part of the <laughs> revenue sharing bill that became law last night. Look, if the governor didn't like the way we passed revenue sharing, if he didn't like the sources of revenue sharing, then he should have vetoed the bill. But he did. And this is exactly what the governor does. He talks out of both sides of his mouth. He did not veto the bill, and now it's become law. So I believe Mainers and I understand that he's okay with the funding of the revenue sharing. He has approved it. And now we need to move forward. And Senator Haskell is exactly right. We have no supplemental budget. We have no plan from the governor's office. And so we're going to keep working as appropriations committee, as leaders with our Republican colleagues, to finish out FY14, look at FY15, and look at that budget, look at you know the Rosen report. We have a lot of work to do, and it's very uh, it's challenging to be sitting here you know, watching all those commissioners wasting time when we could be getting real work done. Several, uh, sorry, I'm walking right here, but several uh, of the commissioners spoke out today talking about how main care is eating up more and more of the budget, and they spoke out against main care expansion. Just uh, your reaction to that. Sure. So just, uh, they're using the word cannibalization, and just if we think about the word cannibalization and the image that we all have, I mean, it is a uh, very, very, uh, I guess disturbing and it illustrates how far this governor and his commissioners will go when he's talking about people, main people. 90% of what we spend main care money on are elderly, children, and disabled mayors. 90%. 10% of what we spend on main care is on able-bodied mayors, the working poor. So if the governor and his commissioners feel that you know, the 90% of the spending on the elderly children and disabled people is the wrong spending, then we'd like to hear their alternative. We'd like to figure out how they would fund, you know, for the most vulnerable Mainers uh, in the state. And then secondly, I mean, as far as health care costs, health care costs have been rising for over a decade. We know that. It's not just rising in the state of Maine. It's rising all over the country. And that's why President Obama and Congress passed the Affordable Care Act to look at many ways to drive down health care costs. And that's why part of the original Affordable Care Act included expansion. It wasn't supposed to be separated, but the Supreme Court decided that it should be separated. And now states, Republican states and Democratic states, are expanding. And that is a good thing for those states here in Maine. Sadly, we've got a governor that will spend more time trying to prevent health care trying to prevent our economy from moving forward instead of doing the opposite, actually having a plan for our economy, strengthening jobs, and also trying to get you know basic health care for Maine people. And a really quick follow-up, and I think that where this is coming from, from the governor and <coughs> the commission, is the fear of the movement that's happening around um, health care expansion and around this Republican proposal that's been brought forward. Um, there's nothing to be afraid of. In fact, the irony is that the state will save money through expanding health care, through accepting these federal dollars. So they could actually use that money that is going to be saved and reinvest or save uh, the money um, that is produced by uh, expanding health care for 70,000 Mainers. So as President Alphon mentioned, dozens of 10, 12, 13 Republican uh, governors across the country have looked at this, evaluated it, and said this is a good thing for our people and our economy. This has become purely political for the governor. Um, 
which is really unfortunate because we are losing out on about a million dollars a day of economic activity. We are losing out on individuals that get sick, that can't go to the doctor. So um, that's what that, that's about. That's why they're pulling together. They're, they're, they're fearful that um, momentum is, is growing and they're trying to create this distraction and this story that doesn't exist. And in fact, if they looked at the facts and they looked at the nonpartisan independent analysis around healthcare expansion, they would understand and see that it actually saves the state money. The irony is, is that everyone that's saying that is standing there saying that to you with government sponsored health care. That's the irony and the embarrassment of it for me. I mean, I can't believe the people who get up there and say, well, we're worthy of having it, but these people aren't. That's really sickening. Are you guys joining the party leaders in calling for Representative Lockman to resign? <laughs> 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 so, so I think what you're referring to is uh, there, there was a blog post and an article in the BBN in regards to comments that Representative Lockman has made over uh, at least the last two or three decades that, that the research shows. Uh, you know, personally, I find those those comments deeply disturbing, highly offensive, and. I, I don't think those were taken out of context. I would really like to hear from Representative Lockman just to see, you know, what his thinking was around those comments. You know, I find those comments to be very hateful, very hurtful, and uh, that, you know, that's not what many people expect from anyone, let alone their elected officials. So I, I, I think the question is for Representative Lockman to respond, and, and is he going to apologize? Is he going to justify these comments and explain how he justifies them? Have you tried to get in touch with him, or has the Speaker's office tried to get in touch with him since this surface? Uh, you know, to be honest, I, I think that Representative Lockman has been a spokesman for this administration. Uh, he's been a, a spokesman for the Republican Party's extreme views on some issues, and I don't think it's really our place to reach out and, and sort of talk to a, Repu a Republican House member. You know, I, I would encourage you to reach out to their leadership and get comment from them on their member. Another ironic part about that, though, is, I mean, if Representative Lockman is not uh, you know, paying his taxes, could he really be here deciding what other people's tax money is going for? I mean, that's, and I don't know if that's accurate or not, but I mean, it certainly is a question that I have in my mind. Mr. Speaker, you've seen nothing in Representative Lockman's comments or activities in the last session that would rise you to question whether or not he should remain in the House, and the House is the determiner of its own members. You, you haven't seen any, any types of remarks or actions that you feel would call his membership into that body into question. I think what was revealed over this past week is extremely alarming for any elected official um, to, to say any statements like that. What I, I think from my perspective and my position, what, what I've seen is that Representative Lockman is a very extreme individual. Um, that says some really extreme things um, on the floor of the House and debate and committee uh, in the hallways. So I think uh, it is for uh, those that elected Representative Lockman to decide. I think it is for himself to decide whether he is going to justify or respond to those comments. Um, there are public comments quoted from you know, piece of press releases and whatnot. So certainly the people of Maine do not tolerate the types of things. You're talking about rape when you're talking about addiction to sodomy, when you're talking about these types of things that are really out of character, out of line, out of step for any elected official to be saying. So, um, you know, I would just say that Representative Lockman needs to speak for himself and answer to his constituents and to the people of Maine. We're done. We went 10 minutes beyond. Thank you for being here.